Hello, everybody. I am here with Professor John Hawks from the University of Wisconsin-Madison here at the World of Paleoanthropology. And today we're going to talk about a lot of things ranging from Neanderthals to Homo naledi genetics and really what open access and what we can do in the world of paleoanthropology. So first off, I would like to hand it over to Professor Hawks and let him introduce himself and just let him go from there. Well, sure. Um, I'm a paleoanthropologist. I, like you said, I'm at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm also a visiting professor at the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. Um, I work on all of human origins, really. Uh, I've written papers on some of the earliest hominins and, and some of the most recent evolution of our species. And what, you know, I'm interested in is finding ways to integrate knowledge from different areas of evidence. You know, I work with genetics, I work with demography, I work with fossils and skeletal evidence. And, you know, what I've always been interested in is trying to fit the big picture together. You know, how can we find mm -hmm. ways for different specialists to articulate with each other and make a more resolved picture than anyone could do on their own? And I think that's a wonderful thing that you're doing. I think you've been very successful at it over the years that you've been working at it. I know I read your blog and I follow it. And I've seen many of your older YouTube lectures and things like that. And I know that you definitely take a very broad approach to human origins. And I think that it's something that you don't see very often in this field. You see usually people that are very focused. And I think having such a broad view on it gives a different perspective that's very helpful. Have you found that to be a hindrance or something that your colleagues have found? Well, you know, I, I grew of? up I grew up in a small town in Kansas and and where I grew up we we don't have scientists in our town, right? You know, the, the mm -hmm. closest thing to a scientist is an, is the engineer that works at the Department of Transportation. And, and so when I was coming into this and getting interested in understanding fossils, understanding human origins, you know, I was reading magazines like National Geographic when I was a kid. And it just, it seemed so exciting and so accessible that we had a story that all of us were somehow part of. And, and scientists were discovering what that story was. When I entered the field, and discovered, you know, actually, the people who are studying this stuff are very, you know, they're a very particular set of people. And, right. and that making it accessible to everybody and making everybody realize the part of the story that all of us are, was not super important to many of the scientists working in this area. And so mm -hmm. from my point of view, what I always wanted to do was to find ways to connect more and more people. And that's certainly been my experience in the field. You know, I, I'm working to connect more people in the United States. I'm working to connect more people, you know, fortunately in Africa, South Africa, particularly where I work. And, and, you know, to be able to reach out to different groups and just say, you know, you're a part of this story. You have something to contribute to it. You know, this is not what scientists discover and they tell you what the answer is. All of us have an opportunity to, to, become engaged with it and to become part of it. And the story of our origins is what connects all of us with each other everywhere in the world, right? We're all part of this story. And it is important as a scientist, not only to look critically at evidence and find new ways to approach it, but also to listen well to people and to hear the part of the story that they have to offer to us. And for me, you know, that's, that's all part of constructing you know, a better picture of, of where all of us fit into this story. And what you find when you do that is the kinds of evidence that were ignored in the past and the kinds of connections that we missed. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's wonderful that we have, you know, a really a revolution in people's ability to access evidence and to become a part of it. I fully, I think that's a beautiful thing that you've said at the fact that people have such great access now has definitely changed the way 
you know, even kids in elementary schools can now get access to materials that five years ago were unheard of. And it's maybe not five years ago now, it's been a little longer, time's gone by quickly, but um, the open access that's been occurring over the last few decades is just really different than what we used to see. And I know you've played a big role in that. And I know that a lot of my community has been very excited for this interview because of that. And we, I just wanna thank you for your role in doing that. And from my community's perspective, you've done a lot. Well, you know, I think it's exciting. And what you see today, you know, today, you know, we played a big role in making some fossil evidence accessible and and that's been very important um but i gotta tell you that you know the work that morphosaurus has done you know doug boyer and his leadership at duke and nsf for funding morphosaurus and making it possible mm -hmm. to share the data in a, in a big way you know the fact that the smithsonian has released a large fraction of its collections to the public under Creative Commons, so that you can go on Morphosaurus and download a lot of the Smithsonian's uh, osteological collection of living and and recent primates. You know, it's it's just amazing that we have a tremendous store of evidence that's out there that anybody can work on. And this is scientific evidence, right? It's not like right. you know just there was a time when people were releasing things that, okay, this is good enough for to use in a class, but it's not good enough for research. We have a huge amount of research stuff out there. And for me, it all came from genetics. I gotta be honest with you, right? I, I, when I went to graduate school and learned to be a paleoanthropologist and worked on fossils and studied, you know, how do we analyze fossils? It was really clear to me, you know, this is in the nineties, it was really clear to me that I was never going to get to see a new fossil. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I went to work in genetics and because in genetics, you could download the evidence. You know, when people right. found evidence, they uploaded it to GenBank and you could download it and work on it because the idea was that you could replicate people's work. And what happens in that process is that people have new ideas about how to combine data sets and create work that nobody would have come up with originally, right? And that was true in genetics in the 1990s when the Human Genome Project was just starting, really. Right. And, and the, the data that we were talking about were in many cases 300 base pairs of mitochondrial data from a bunch of things, right? Mm -hmm. And today we're talking about hundreds of thousands of whole genomes right. that you can just download and do any kind of new analysis you want to. Well, with the fossils that we work on, what's wonderful about them is that they are evocative, right? I've worked with a lot of museums and it's really easy to make a museum exhibit around a fossil because people understand the object. You can see it. You know, just... You've got something like OH5 here and you can build something around it, right? right. And with a DNA sequence, it's a little harder to do. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you, yeah. So you have to be more creative in your storytelling. Um, and so the fact that we put, you know, hundreds of fossils online, right? I don't want to minimize. We have hundreds of fossils online, but it's still a tiny fraction of the human evolutionary record with thousands of fossils. And I would love to be in a place where every fossil that is found goes into this replicable online people can download it and access, you know, format so that we can actually come up with new science that's using the evidence that, that the primary data gatherers, like us in, 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 in the Naledi project, we're, we're primary data gatherers. We're, we're collecting new data, but we're providing that to everybody so that you can do your own analysis. And it makes the science better for everybody. Now, what, what are the hindrances? Is it specific individuals? Is it certain laws? Is it like what's hindering open access at this time? I want everybody to understand, you know, we work in a complicated landscape where um, the primary data in our field 
is coming from around the world, from, from places, you know, I'll include the Americas in this, right? Because the story of human origins is a story that is worldwide, right? It's about all of the first peoples of the world and all of their common ancestors. And, and when we look at that, think of the different complexities that come into it, right? Mm -hmm. One complexity is that, is that individuals have some kind of interest in their immediate ancestors and relatives, you know? We're talking not about, in many cases, the ancestors of all humans or the distant relatives of all humans. We're talking about relatives of particular populations. And it is wrong, ethically wrong, to do research on those groups and populations and their ancestors without consultation and, and coordination with the communities that are the descendants today, right? So you've got one big part of, of our, our science is a comparative science. In order to do work on fossils that are unrelated, you know, in any close way to any living people, I need to understand the anatomy of living people and our variation to do good science on that. Mm -hmm. And that means working effectively with many communities around the world who are participants in our science because they're allowing us to use data from relatives and ancestors. So that's one big part of it, right? And that means we don't take fossil, we don't take skeletal remains of humans and put them on morphosource in the same way that we might do skeletal remains of living primates. Because right, there's an right. ethical obligation that we have to make sure that we have some kind of informed consent about what these data are going to be used for. That's equally true of genetic data. Right, people who provide genetic data on humans that they've taken have done so under informed consent guidelines where the people who are providing their genetic sequences are saying, I agree that this is gonna be provided for research. And, and people who are doing other kinds of research, you know, where it involves phenotypes, like the, the UK Biobank, are doing so under, under agreements that researchers who access the data fulfill certain standards and and sign on right that's not just open for everybody right. so so there's a landscape of it that is about the humans who are part of this and and their rights and and our obligations as researchers and to do the right thing ethically there's another part which has to do with the different nations in the world who are the custodians of the of the human heritage that that is theirs right i work right. in south africa and the work that we do is working very closely with the south africa heritage resource agency sara and with the universities where we're based and it, for me the university of Witwatersrand, with landowners who are responsible for the use of their property and and the they don't have proprietary rights over the fossils in South Africa. That's that's heritage and, and the government's involved, but they do have rights to who accesses the properties and how that's going to be used, right? And so you're working with many different levels, and every country in the world has different regulations and laws. Some of them have agreements through UN for this, the United Nations, and UNESCO is involved in many of them. We work in a World Heritage Site, a UNESCO Heritage Site that has mm -hmm. oversight. Um, and so when you're getting there to say, you know, we're gonna take these objects, which everyone recognizes are precious, you know, for, for many reasons, and release them. You know, we want everyone who's involved at every level to benefit from that. And, and there are many countries where that calculation, you know, hasn't yet been worked out of, mm -hmm. you know, it's in everybody's interest for certain kinds of data to be available. And that doesn't detract from the heritage value of the object that we're talking about. In fact, it adds to it in our experience. Right. But, but in order to get to that place where, you know what, we all recognize that this is the way that this works. And, and the science has certain kinds of things that we want to be able to do um, that, that make the science better. And actually, when you do that, when you provide that scientific access to these objects, it enhances their heritage value and makes them much more valuable 
in the context in, for heritage and for museums and for institutions and for countries. Um, you know, that's something where I talk with a lot of people and there are genuine hesitations that people have and concerns that they have about, you know, the idea that they're releasing their, their treasures and are somehow not benefiting from that. And that is a real concern, right? Because we're talking about really a colonial scientific enterprise that has right. a heritage itself that is highly damaging to many of the countries that we work in and to many of the colleagues that we have that are working in those countries, right? So, so it's not just about releasing the data, right? It's about recognizing the source of the data, valuing and providing value to the participants at every level in that data collection and, and recognizing them appropriately. And as, as a US citizen, right, as an American, it's my, you know, I am not a citizen of many of the countries where I rely upon colleagues and collaborators and where I have worked. And, and that is, I think today, the way that paleoanthropology is changing, the changes that we're seeing, you know, manifest, are changes that are you know, recognizing that this can't be a colonial science anymore. It has to be a science where the, the things that we build together are benefiting the countries that are the custodians of the heritage and are creating science you know, in those countries. And as a, as a US researcher, that's my commitment. So you know, it's, a, it's a complicated landscape we're talking about. Right. And and it's one where you say, well, you know, what's stopping this from happening? What's stopping it from happening is that I work with a lot of people in the past. I I I have a lot of professional colleagues who are near or past retirement age who were assholes. <laughs> and, <laughs> and 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 the fact is that today we have to build a science that is more equitable, that is better you know, for, for everybody. And that's what we're working on doing. Right. And I'm, I'm very glad that you took the time to explain that entire process of, you know, the custodian countries and their rights and the customs of, not the customs, but the cultural aspects of it, because it is so important. I think it is often overlooked. I mean, I personally have not considered all the different levels that you were talking about. And I think as a young paleoanthropologist, just getting into the field, that's something I need to be very aware of and something that a lot of people need to know about. So I'm glad we went over that. Now, um, segueing a little bit, you know, we were talking about people nearing retirement age and it makes me think of some old ideas that have changed in the last decade that you have been specifically a part of. And I wanted to know, back around 2000, 2001, when that Tim White paper came out stating that we were done finding fossils, where were you? Like, what, was, <laughs> what was your opinion? Of I, was, I was reading that paper as a young scientist, right? As somebody who had, was just finishing my PhD. And this is a really influential paper, right? It's, it's sort right. of a view of, of paleoanthropology at the millennium. And, and everyone should read it who's interested in this field. Um, because, you know, White was tremendously perceptive, you know, I, and, and you look back at that paper and you can see that many of the things that, that were elements of that paper really were problems and some of the things that he predicted did come to pass you know the 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 lack of you know the the re-emphasis in funding schemes in the US and Europe at that time you know which which sort of snowballed from field exploration you know going out and finding fossils to laboratory analyses 
you know, to where, you know, the, the funding that has happened in paleoanthropology, right, directed toward collaborative work in paleoanthropology has mostly gone into laboratory-based research. Um, he saw that happening. He criticized it in that paper. And, and that was an important thing to point out, right? Because what we've seen is that actually it became really hard to get any funding to find fossils. As a young scientist, I read that paper and I said, wow, here's somebody who's one of the leaders of the field who's, who's saying it's wrong for us to be training people to do only lab work. It's wrong to be, you know, to be reorienting, to be training hundreds and hundreds of scientists for working on dozens of fossils, you know, that right. it's unsustainable. And he was absolutely right. This passage, the ecosystem of paleoanthropology is 100% correct. Um, and so as a young scientist, I read that and I said, wow, you know, I'm going into genetics because <laughs> data are growing. The human genome project was, I did, right? I right. left studying fossils and right. went into human genetics. <laughs> so I can't, you know, I lived that history. It was something where right. you look at it and it's like, wow, you know, I read that. I took it seriously. I left. Um, and what I learned over, over time, as I've talked to other people about, you know, that moment in the history of, of the science is, you know, the, the damage that they perceive that came from a really prominent person saying, we've found all the fossils, mm -hmm. that there's, there's not going to be huge discoveries in the future. Because today, from today's standpoint, you look at it and say, wow, you know, we've had actually unprecedented discoveries in the last 10 years. Right. And, and so that, in retrospect, you look at it, it's a, this is 2020, right? So we can say 2020 hindsight. Um, you look at it from the 2020 perspective and you can say, wow, that was actually a bad prediction. But it wasn't a totally wrong prediction. Um, the fact is that the traditional fossil exploration that he's talking about there really has seen incremental progress. You know, they right. have opened up new sites. They have found significant new things, um, but, but at a rate that's pretty consistent with what White had predicted. Okay, that I that's a very interesting point that you're making the distinction of the type of discoveries because we do have, of course, you know, the Homo naledi discoveries, the Deba, where they're they're in subterranean um, areas versus just walking around the fields and finding something on the surface. You and know, I, I think. think that's super important to realize is that the major discoveries that we have had are discoveries that have come from looking in places that people were not looking. And, right. and that's, you know, the new ways of looking have been super important to this. And, you know, many scientists who are accomplished professionals, great friends of mine have different perspectives on this. I can just say that more eyes looking in more places has generated more discoveries. That's, that's you know, it, there's really not something much more complicated than that, except right. it's hard to get into some of the places we're looking. <laughs> I don't want to underemphasize the fact that exactly. we're making discoveries in places that, that re there's a reason why nobody discovered them. It's because they're hard <laughs> to get to. We've um, previously, I'm not sure if you're aware, but previously on the show, we've had uh, Rick Hunter. Oh yeah, yeah, sure, so, Rick, yeah. He talked about going through the cave system and discovering all the caverns and everything. So mm -hmm. we got a little taste of that craziness. Um, but yeah, it's definitely not to be underestimated where these fossils are actually being found. And it's just, it truly just makes it that much more amazing that we have these discoveries. Which brings us, I think, perfectly to the next topic that I'd like to talk about, which is your involvement in the 2013 Rising Star Expedition. Oh, sure, sure, okay. So what, what was your role, and what did you take away from it? You know, it's, 
I would just say that it, it was a big team. And as one of the really, you know, as one of the paleoanthropologists on the team, I can't say that any of us had a, a you know, really special role. You know, it was, okay. wow, we suddenly are in a situation where we have discovered an enormous number of fossils and, and in a field work setting, it is really, okay, Let's do what we need to do to understand these, to collect information about their context, to conserve the fossils, and and to you know bring in, you know, it, it, to plan right. How are we going to study these things? And and so you know it was an extraordinary setting because of the density of fossil material. And I don't want to you know a lot of people have have watched you know, sort of the Nova special about this or have read our book, right, Almost right. Human, and, and maybe know something about it. One thing that I find people sort of misunderstanding about, about our work is, is in that entire expedition, right? We're talking about a month of underground ex excavation. Our actual excavation was sort of like the size of, uh, you know, not a shoebox, but, but not as big as, you know, <laughs> it, it was a very small excavation. You know, we probably removed right. three or four liters of sediment <laughs> together right. with, 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 you know, about, you know, several hundred fossils. And why is that, right? Because the spot that we happened to excavate was very fossil dense and it took us a month to work, you know, through it. Um, it is always amazing to me because people have very different perceptions of what field work is like. You know, to to say, you know, we're really working in a setting that is like a mixed assemblage of of many different individuals. Some of them articulated, some of them not. It's a complex setting, and we you know, at that stage had investigated only a small part of it. Um, today, we've investigated some more, but not a huge amount more. You know, our total knowledge of the Dinaletti chamber is still, you know, limited to. Uh, an excavation area that's much smaller than the top of my desk. Um, right. It that's is, incredible. you know, it, it's, it's, it's not a lot. Uh, it's a lot of fossils, right? It's a, it's a very dense assemblage of fossils. Um, and it gives us a tremendous amount of information, which we're still collecting. So as far as data collection goes, when it comes to Rising Star, is it still where the data is coming in so fast that you guys are can't analyze it or are we actually getting to the point where we're analyzing the data and finding things out that we did not know before well you know i can i can give you a you know obviously you know in covid times everything sort of happens at a different pace and, right right and we have team members in south africa who are super engaged uh with with some Naledi stuff, but of course we have excavation that's happening at a couple of sites, right? Malapa right. has excavation happening, Rising Star has some excavation happening, and uh, and the 105 site has excavation. Of happening. course, um, we have international, you know, collaborators, U.S. and Europe, who are working on some fossil material, you know, it, working on data from fossil material, um, and and I can give you a hint of that, right? I can say that in you know, I'm working on a paper now with with colleagues that's describing a an excavated locality in you know sort of near the Dinaletti chamber that's a new place where we found fossils and we have a you know really wonderful juvenile cranial you know cranium there that we're describing um, we have in the excavation um, in the Dinaletti chamber, we have an infant that's undescribed so far that our team is oh, wow. working to try to describe. We have um, blocks that were removed from the hill antechamber in the cave system a couple of years ago that we're, you know, tr trying to work out, you know, there's a partial juvenile skeleton and some additional material in one of the blocks that we're trying to work out. You know, there's a lot of stuff that's happening. And it is overall a complicated picture because the, what we're trying to do is to understand the overall situation in the cave system, which involves many localities with fossils of Homo naledi, and, and understand how naledi was using the cave system, 
we're doing so on the basis of very small and targeted excavations. And so, you know, obviously we've got years and years of work to try to understand right. overall what the cave system is. So from what you, the data that you have collected, just because I've heard this before, but I want to clarify, do we actually have every stage of maturity in Homo naledi represented in the fossil record? We have um, a, at least one neonate age individual, um, so near birth or maybe pre, prenatal. We've got, at this stage, I think four or five infant naledis, so you know, individuals that don't have their first molars erupted. Um, we have at least three um, sort of five to 10 year old individuals a couple of adolescents and probably, I don't know, we're talking now maybe eight or nine adults, one old adult wow. out of that. Yeah, so wow. yeah, we've got it all. Um, and it is fascinating. You know, earlier this year, our team, uh, Debbie Bolter led it, was published an association between some of the juvenile skeletal material that constitutes a skeleton from our original excavation. The thing about uh, an assemblage like this, we've got the bones of lots of individuals and, and we're still doing science to determine which bones belong to which individuals. Um, right. In a, in a modern human setting, well, in a modern human setting, if we were super interested in this, we would sample DNA from all the bones and start it out. <laughs> we can't do that with Naledi. Um, but we're out, we have, obviously, because it is a unique assemblage that represents an extinct species, we're spending much more time trying to sort this out than we would for modern humans. For modern humans, we would leave it at, well, it's a commingled assemb assemblage, and we would describe it as sort of a bulk thing. In... Uh, in the Naledi situation, we can do quite a lot to reconstruct and rebuild these skeletons from the parts, and and that's what we're doing. So it's it's going to take some time, but that's uh, we're going to learn much more about these. That's just incredible. And I mean, once I'm through schooling, it's my goal to be you know on one of those teams that is doing this work on Homo naledi. So I, I hope there's plenty of work to go around, which it sounds like <laughs> there is. Um, well, it's, it's a wonderful thing is that as we push the boundaries of this and say, you know, if we throw our technology and our resources at this kind of a question, we're going to discover things about the rest of the fossil record that that are not apparent right. to us today. Right. And just like, you know, we're watching developments at other sites like Cima de los Huesos in Spain. Um, you know, there's wonderful developments happening with sites where they're doing uh, you know, really high resolution life history data from teeth, you know, that, that we haven't done with Naledi yet. Um, you know, there's there's amazing developments in the science that are going to come together and give us a picture that's much more res resolved than what we've had available before. Right, right. Which is just, you know, the further technology progresses, which brings me to my next question. So I know, have you actually, have there been attempts? I know it's out of the range, the normal range, but have there been attempts to get DNA from Naledi? Oh, it's in the range. Um, the oldest DNA from, from fossil hominin specimens is Cima de los Huesos, and that's more than 400,000 years okay. old. Okay. So uh, yeah, the, the problem is that, you know, some of the European cave environments are much colder temperature, and that's you know, better for preserving DNA. Right. In, right. Uh, in Rising Star, we have attempted to get DNA sequences from some uh, skeletal material of Naledi. We have, all of that is, is, has produced no results. And at the moment, we just wait. Uh, technology is developing. I have right. every expectation that as it improves, we're going to have the potential of trying something different and see, you know, if, if there is biochemical preservation. Um, it's not preserved with today's technology. Is is our answer? Okay. Well, that is a fair answer. Mm -hmm. Now, where do you? So, speaking of the future, you know, where do you see this field going in the next ten years? We just hit twenty twenty. Where do you see us by twenty thirty? 
<laughs> well, you know, if you'd asked me that in 2010, I don't know what I would have predicted. <laughs> so it's a bit tough. Um, you know, think of what we've learned in the last 10 years. First, we've learned that the pattern of relationships of fossil populations is not what we believed 15 years ago, right? We, there were people like me 15 years ago who were talking about hybridization and the importance of mixture of populations, but I didn't even perceive that it would be so ubiquitous that we would study every fossil that we find DNA from gives us evidence of new mixtures, right? Right. And, and that concept that separation followed by mixture was a really ubiquitous pattern in human origins is a big discovery. It changes the way that we look at things. Look at the news that we've had, you know, just this week about, right. uh, you know, this, this Paranthropus skull uh, from, from Drimolin. Look at that and, and they're talking about evidence of evolution in that population. We have to move to the point where we're talking about evidence of mixture between these populations because we know that mixture was happening everywhere. And so what influence did that have? I think that in 10 years, we're gonna have a better appreciation of this because the way that we're building data sets about human variation and connections between genetic and morphological variation in humans, we're gonna know much more about this in 10 years. Um, we're going to have better data sets. Again, a big change in 10 years, right? Seeing that we have distinct hominin rich assemblages that occur. And if you sample enough caves, you're gonna find some hominin rich assemblages. We're going to have more of those, right? And, and I gotta believe that, that we're going to have them from parts of the world that today we're not thinking about. So, you know, certainly my goal as an anthropologist, many people's goals is let's figure out where we're missing, what, what are we missing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, because getting expeditions to cast a wide net and start to outline what is the big picture here and, and where are those occurrences that are hominin rich is a big deal. And we're gonna see more of that. Um, we're gonna see more, I, think of the way that COVID is changing our science right now. Um, you know, COVID has created a situation where international travel is more difficult, more complicated, which means that travel is gonna to have to be more episodic. And what that means is that we have to reinvent our way of doing field work, right? And we've gone through, the last 10 years has been a time of transition from Right. If you said 20 years ago, what does field work look like? In many parts of the world, field work, work looks like an American team coming or a European team coming to some country, working with some local collaborators and, and work being done for three weeks in the field. Right. Right. The effective projects, the ones that are working right now, are the projects like ours, where it's a South African based team, where people are working all year round on sites where excavation is happening to follow the scientific goals and not science being shaped around a three week excavation season. Um, that pattern of working, which is much more led from the, the, the nations and countries where fossils are, is going to be more and more ubiquitous as we move forward. And that means that we have to shift the way that we recognize the science, we need to shift investment in the science so that the investment is happening where the science is done. And that's, you know, I, you can say that, well, you know, why did it take a worldwide pandemic to get people <laughs> to realize that this should happen? It's, it's not only that, right? It's the fact is that the science has been shifting this way. Right. And you can see the productivity of teams where the collaboration is much more led from the countries where work is done. Um, 
but it takes institution building, it takes building students and human capital in the places where work is being done. It takes shifting investment. And I'd say in 2030, I believe we're gonna be looking at a world where the investment is happening where the fossils are. And that's going to be a major, major important shift because it makes the science better for that investment to be there. And I think that would definitely be a positive change and we would definitely get more data amount analyzed and get a lot more information on our finds. Now, just shifting gears before we end this real quick, have you read, I assume you have, um, Rebecca Rag Sykes' new book, uh, Neander, or Kindred, I just have to look like around my desk because I've got a copy of it. You're sitting here somewhere. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, do a little advertisement. Yes, we've got, we've so got a copy we of So yeah, we had her on earlier, and I personally love the book. Uh, what wow. are As someone who has been in this field and working genetically with Neanderthals and with their fossils for years, what is your take on this new book? You know, what, uh, what she does so well in this book is to draw out the human stories, right, of Neanderthals and to use evidence, right, archeological evidence for the most part, but sometimes skeletal evidence and sometimes genetic evidence, to use evidence to draw that thread that says, hey, somebody noticed this thing and then somebody else noticed the second thing. And then there, then the fact that those two things had been noticed, there's a third thing, right? I mm -hmm. think that the science of Neanderthals, first of all, Neanderthals are not, you know, I don't think different or exceptional in our evolutionary story, except insofar as a lot of Europeans have dug up a lot of them. <laughs> a, I don't think that they're exceptional in their having in there being more fossils, right? Today we know about more Neanderthal fossils because Europeans have been working hard to dig them up for 150 years. Right. And much of that work, I just want to say, much of that work was done 150 to 80 years ago when scientists would go to a cave and so I say scientist, right? In many cases, scientists is sort of a loose term for, for bone collectors or bone salespeople, right? They would go to a cave and hoist out just cubic meters of deposit, right? Nobody has dug this way <laughs> as, as archaeologists, right, for 50 years. <laughs> and, and, and so you say we have a lot of Neanderthals. Yeah, because a lot of sites were destroyed. A lot of sites, right. the people came in, they dug everything out, they destroyed the evidence that, that today we would collect contextually and, and brought out bones. And we know a lot about those bones. We know a lot about the, the tool assemblages from them. But what Neanderthals have been for the past 20 years is a process of relatively much smaller but highly controlled, highly high resolution excavations producing new evidence, you know, things like the fibers that are coming out from sites, things like the, things like the, the, um, the microfossils in dental calculus, right? The, the, these stories of how the science is, is narrowing down. And what people are doing is saying, wait a minute, hey, there's all this stuff that we missed before. And when you actually start building that up into a picture, you're getting a picture that, that changes what you knew. But B, now we have a new way to look at our old collections, right? So Kropina, which was a site that was dug 1899-1900 by uh, Gorjanovic Kromberger. Kropina is a super important site in Croatia. And Gorjanovic was a great excavator for his time. He was super responsible. He took good records. You can still track, track down the levels that things came from in his collections, right? But he didn't notice that there were eagle talons that were altered that he'd collected. And it took Dvor Karadovcic, who's now curator of the fossil collection, 
to realize, hey, people are finding eagle talons at these Neanderthal sites. And what about the ones from Krapina? And looking at them and seeing, oh, wait a minute, wow, these are altered. And there's remains of a fiber on one of them, right? And, and you start sort of thinking these old sites have rejuvenated because of our new approaches that have caused to look at things that weren't seen before. I really believe that the rest of human evolution story is there like this. We haven't excavated it yet. And the wonderful thing is that there are sites like Rising Star where we're finding it now and we're able to excavate it in a modern way and we're uncovering amazing evidence, right, that was probably there for Neanderthals in 1890. <laughs> Right. <laughs> if you could travel, if somebody asked me once, if I could travel back in time to any time in the world, what, where would I go, right? Because I study the past. And my answer to this is, I would go back to 1856. And I would go around and convince everyone to protect the caves. <laughs> <laughs> so that they didn't destroy all the Neanderthal sites. Yeah. <laughs> it is something I wonder, <laughs> you know, over human history, how many fossils have been just found laying on the ground that people have destroyed just randomly. It, you know, who knows? It, it, it's it's amazing. You know, I go to somewhere like Taboon. Taboon is a super important site. It is in Israel. It is a keystone site in terms of our ability to correlate time periods in is in Israel in Levantine archaeology. Because, um, because it's the only site that has a full sequence of archaeology going back to Ashula Yabrudian and then all the way up, right? And you, there's a classic profile of Taboon. You go to the site now and you can see the profile and they've got, you know, signs posted that show you what's what. And that was all dug by Dorothy Garrett in, um, in the 1930s. And Garrett was great at her time, amazing. She, she really is one of these trowel blazers, right? The people who, the women who are leading the science at that time. And yet, oh my God. <laughs> when I think in Rising Star, I'm working in an excavation where I'm hesitant to remove another centimeter of material. <laughs> and I'm looking at a profile that is like just like 20 meters. <laughs> and I think that was just all taken out in in a short period of time. And and the dumps, you know, from right. the site are there. And the debates that we have about where does this this the taboon fossil and Neanderthal skeleton, right? Comes from it and it's debated, right? Where exactly? Because we can't oh my God. You know, <laughs> and and so our science has changed enormously. We are enormously better at perceiving, recognizing evidence, at documenting evidence, and we still have so far left to go. Right. We have not come right the, the future is going to look back at at our period of time, it's going to say, oh, my God, I can't believe what they were ignoring, right. what they missed. I recognize right. that. It's why it's important for us to be deliberate and slow and to only excavate to, to, to be very specific in our goals. But also, we have to be open to exploration. If we don't explore, there will be no science tomorrow. And, and so it is creating that trade of we're exploring, we're finding something new, it's changing the way that we think, and that creates the groundwork for the next generation of science. And I think that is a perfect place for this interview to conclude with a hope for the future and for future scientists. So I'm going to stop recording. And thank you so much for being on our show. You've been a wonderful guest and you've answered all of our questions wonderfully. So thank you just so much. Great, I appreciate it. And, and I'd say to everybody, right, this is the best time to enter this field. It is, we, we are making huge discoveries, but we are on the cusp of making even bigger ones. And it is an exciting time 
and no matter what element of it you get involved with, you know, from genetics to, you know, to molecular science, to micro stratigraphy, to geology, to, you know, traditional anatomy, there's something for everybody in this. And that's wonderful. And I encourage everyone to follow their dreams and to never stop exploring, as our friend Lee Berger likes to say. So there we go.